Thank you for your time and thank you for letting us speak to you. So let's start off with uh, how has your experience been in India so far uh, and what do you think of the love for basketball here? Uh, my experience has been great. You know, I've had a really good time since I got here. Obviously, started off in Mumbai and now here in Chennai. But um, you know, just looking particularly at the basketball aspect of it, um, the kids that we've worked with so far, I think the biggest thing that I've seen is just the passion and the desire. Like they want to learn about basketball, and that's what the beauty of a program with the Junior NBA and the Reliance Foundation. Just the beauty of wanting to start at the grassroots level to teach the skills so that by the time the kids get old enough to really start, you know, playing and being really active in basketball, um, hopefully they'll be really good and, mm -hmm. you know, have the opportunity to reach their goal, which is being in the NBA or the WNBA. Right, 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 excellent. Never know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's the plan. I mean, that's the plan of the foundation. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about your early years. I mean, what drew you to pick up basketball? I mean, I know about your struggles as a child and how did basketball help you come back to the struggle? Well, um, sports in particular, you know, just growing up with a hearing problem and a speech problem, having to wear hearing aids and getting bullied a lot um, early on. I mean, that's where sports became my outlet. It was something that you know I could go out and soccer was my first sport, then softball, and then basketball was actually my third sport that I played. Okay. Fun, organized. Um, I played in the playground, and my dad played, so we would go to practice and watch him, but. For me, you know, it was a, a way that I could kind of escape everything that was going on around me and have the opportunity, like, I could practice and get really, really good at something. So, basketball, I go and I practice and I practice. So, when somebody made fun of me, I said, okay, well, let's go play basketball. You know, and I would try to beat them as bad as I could. But that was, like, my way of being able to escape and, and also a way for me to kind of fit in with the rest of the kids. Sure, sure. And uh, speaking about your dad, he, he, he played in the NBA for over a decade with Saudi catching. So, so how did uh, did that you know influence you to pursue the sport professionally at, at some point or and what was I mean his key advice or motivation that you know helped you improve your game in your early years? Yeah, I was in seventh grade when I made the goal that I wanted to be in the NBA. Like I wanted to follow my dad's footsteps right. and be like my dad because the WNBA wasn't around. And so you know I just remember that time like I sat down. I was like you know what one day I'm gonna be in the NBA. And I'm gonna, I don't care if I'm a girl. I don't care what people <laughs> say, but that's what I want to do. And when I told my mom and dad, they believed in me and they said, you know what, if you work really, really hard, you can do it. And I know that having the, the, the confidence that they had in me actually boosted up my own self-confidence. Like, you know, they believe in me, so I should believe in myself too. And, uh, you know, the thing that my, my parents did, they put us in a lot of sports. Okay. So I have an older brother and an older sister. I mean, we did, so I talked about soccer, softball, basketball, volleyball, ran track, did gymnastics, t tennis lessons. So. Then we did a lot of different sports, but that was like the one sport that, after all of that, I still wanted to play basketball. Like, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad sat me down and he was like, look, I'll help you as much as you want me to help you. Whenever you feel like, you know what, dad, I want to walk away from the game or whatever, just tell me. We walk away, no hard feelings, nobody's mad, nobody's angry. He said, the only thing that I ask is that whatever you do in your life, you, be, you stay passionate. And when you lose the passion for what you're doing, you need to find something else. Okay. And I'm still passionate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it shows. So, uh, and speaking about your early years again, you know, high, your high school, uh, you were the only, the first player to record a quintuple double. In this sport I mean, I haven't been able to get a video of that game, but I, mean, I don't think there like, is one. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you were unstoppable that day. I mean, so tell us a little bit about that game. Yeah, you know what? Unstoppable to the point that I don't really even remember. Um, <laughs> That's just the way that I play the game, you know, I, I just go all out and I love being on the court, I love being active and just playing and, you know, I think the one thing that's different is just being an all-around player. And Alonzo Mourning was my favorite player growing up, went to Charlotte Hornets and he went to Miami Heat and now he's like high up in the front office for the Miami Heat, but I used to love watching him because he was the kind of player that he was big. He was strong, but if they needed a basket, he could score. If they needed some a defensive stop, he could stop somebody. Rebound, he could pass. He did everything, and he just seemed like a great leader on the court. So for me, as a little girl watching him, you know, I was like, that's my favorite player. I'm like, I want to be like him, where I can score if my team needed me to score. I can get a defensive stop if my team needed me to get a defensive stop. I could rebound, I could pass. You know, just being an all-around player. So would you say that Alonzo Mourning is your inspiration, your I mean, he's influenced your game, the way you play the game? 
Well, of course. Like my parents, I mean, my family overall would be first and foremost. Like they're the reason that I'm the person I am. But as far as like my role model after the, my after my family, like yeah, he's definitely the one. Now coming to your college uh, years, you played at the University of Tennessee for four years. So how did that program, I mean it's a great program and it's produced numerous stars, so how did the playing for four years in college help you, you know, compete in the pro game? Well, playing for the best coach ever in the world, <laughs> Pat Summit, um, you know, just having the opportunity to be under her wings. And the one thing that Pat always told us is we're not only going to be great basketball players, but we're going to be great in the, in the classroom and we're going to be great in the community and overall just being a great woman and so you know you go four years with those instructions like I, I, don't, I, I don't care about just one thing I want the overall package and so you know for me that's, that's what I learned the most you know of course she was hard on us but that's what I needed and that's what I wanted I wanted somebody that you know you see where I'm trying to go and you see that I'm trying to make it to the NBA but the WNBA came my freshman year in college so then I wanted to be in the WNBA but she saw like my ultimate goal and she pushed me to be able to, to get to that level. Right, right. So as, as we all know, the WNBA started only in 1996, like you said, when in your freshman year in college. So if the WNBA, you know, say it had not started or, uh, and your, your initial goal was to get into the NBA, so do you think that was a realistic possibility? I mean, how has the WNBA helped, uh, you know, women basketball uh, progress from college to a professional level? I mean, if the WNBA wasn't there, it would be only the NBA as an option. So how do you think that helped? I think, I mean, it definitely helped. Yeah, of course it, it gave opportunities right. for women to be able to play, you know, the game that we love here in America. Because right. even back then, the opportunities overseas were still there. But with the WNBA there, it allowed for, you know, us to have a league in America. And really, I mean, it, it's been around, it, we'll be celebrating 20 years next year with the W. This is our 19th season that we're coming into. So if you think about it, we're the longest standing professional women's league in the world. We got players from all over the world that aspire to be in the WNBA and have the opportunity to be a part of the best women's league, right. period. And so having that in the beginning, you know, now when you look at and we're doing the junior NBA program and with the Reliance Foundation, we're doing all these programs here in India and, you know, we cover across Asia. We, you know, we go to Europe, obviously in America. I mean, you provide opportunities for all these young girls. Now they're not just looking at the NBA stars and looking at the men. Like Alonzo Mourning was my favorite because who else was I, you know, going to look at? Yeah, other, yeah. But other women did I see playing? And so um, now, you know, we're providing these opportunities for these young girls to. I want to do that. I want to be like her when I grow up. Right, right. And you also played outside the US in, in clubs in Turkey and. In Asia or so. So, what do you think of the talent level outside the U.S.? Is, has basketball truly become an international sport? Basketball has always been an, an international sport, right. and it will continue. Of, yeah, in terms of talent level, I mean, how does it compare? Is yeah, it, you know? um, the talent level. I mean, I feel like it continued to get better, right. and it continued to get better because of the possibilities right. and the opportunities that are now out there for you know for girls to, to play and. Um, specifically to be in the WNBA. But you know, I think when you look at the different leagues, I played in South Korea for five years, I did a half a year in Russia, one year in Poland, two years in Istanbul, Turkey, and then I finished in China. Um, there's American players on each of the teams overseas. Right. So I think what it kind of establishes and what it kind of helps is when you see these players such as myself or whoever's on a team, you know, these younger players like look up to us and they want to be like us and so they're constantly asking questions and constantly watching like how we do things on the court which improves the game because some people you need to tell okay this is what you need to do and some people they get better by watching and some people need both of them so having you know a leader on their team or a player you know that is part of the WNBA on their team you know gives them an opportunity to first hand like I just need to learn I need to watch this person and continue to work on my game. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about defense. I mean, you've been defensive <laughs> player of the year five times, and it's an amazing achievement. So, how do you prepare for your defensive matchups? I mean, what sets you apart defensively? Yeah, I love it now. But I will be honest with you, I didn't start loving defense until my freshman year in college. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Up until then, my my sister and I played on the same team. But she was the defensive stopper, and I was the one that scored all the points. Okay. Um, but. Pat, she changed my mentality real fast. And she was just like, you know, you have an opportunity 
to change the game by playing defense and by getting really, really good at it. And so I think the biggest thing for me is because of my hearing problem, I had to learn how to be very observant. So like I was always constantly looking around. So in hindsight, when I look back now, I'm like, you know, I went for a period of time without having my hearing aids and nobody knew. Really okay. just, I threw my hearing aids out when I was young. I just wanted to fit in and that was like the thing that was like keeping me from being normal. So I threw them out for really since from my third grade on to my freshman year in college. I didn't wear my hearing aids at all. Okay. But in basketball, it made me have to look around. It made me have to pay attention. It made me like I read lips, you know. So okay. it made me just be aware. so on the court aware. Yeah, so on yeah. the court. Yeah. You know, so now on the court, like I almost see things happen before, before they, they happen. happen. <laughs> That's intriguing. That's amazing. So, I mean, who do you think is the toughest player to guard? I mean, that you had to face. The toughest player that mm-hmm. I've had to guard, um, it have to be a current player or no, just period. I say the toughest player I ever had to guard was Shemiko Holtzclaw. Okay. And the, and the reason why it was so tough is because Meek is so good at everything. And she's such like a, a finesse player. She's finesse, but she's tough. Right, and right. she's the kind of player like, you know, like she's so like fluid, her body just kind of like moves <laughs> and she makes things look so easy. <laughs> yeah, it, it just, it was quite like, to guard her, you think you have her shut down one way and then she like makes a move and gets by you. So as a defensive specialist, you get frustrated, but you love the challenge that it presents. Right, right, right. Now, it took you, I mean, you, you've you been in the Indiana Fever your entire career and it took you a decade to win a championship. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, what kept you going, what kept, what kept you persevering through all those years to fight, keep coming back fighting for a championship? Well, the thing that keeps you going is every single year you have media day <laughs> before the season starts. And the first question all the media ask is, is this the year? Is this the year? And every year I say yes because <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. But um, yeah, I mean, I think for us, it was just a matter of, we had the talent and it's just putting everything together and making it all work, you know? So for me, you know, really like, what can I do to be a better teammate and a better leader for my teammates? And that's what I continue to focus on, you know, because you can't do everything for the team. So you have to be able to empower the players around you to do their job, to make it easier so that we can win together. And that was like the biggest thing, you know, like, okay, we're going to keep pushing because we're getting close. Like we got really close 2009, we got yeah. all the way to game five and yeah. then we lost yeah. and it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so now we're going 2010, we get out in like the second round yeah. and yeah. you know, that was probably the most frustrating year of all. And then 2011, like we're right there and then we get to 2012 when we win it. Was there a missing piece? I mean, all those years after 2009, 10, 11? What clicked in 2012 if you went on that championship run? Well, 2009, when I think about it, we were so excited to make it that far. Okay. You can't be excited to make it. You have to know, you know, like every single game and every single possession, like you have to go and know, like, okay, we have to win this game. Right. We were up 2-0. Two, two yeah, yeah. And we lost three games straight. So. That must have been heartbreaking. I mean, Heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> we were up two <laughs> hours and we lost three games straight. So, you know, the next time when we finally made it back to the final, which was 2012, you know, it really was, we're not going to get excited because we were the underdog. Nobody expected us to win anyway. We're going up against the Minnesota Lynx and they have Byron Moore and Simone Augustus and Lindsey Whalen and Rebecca Brunson, Taj McWilliam. I mean, they have all the stars on their team. So when you look at it on paper, we weren't expected to win anyway. Yeah. We won the first game and everybody was like, oh, it's a fluke. You know, they'll, they'll lose the rest of the game. Then they won the next game. But even if you think about it, it's like we lost players along the way. So we wa- we lost our best shooter, Katie Douglas, yeah. in the first in the set what against Connecticut. Yeah. Then we get to the final and we lose Jeanette Poland, which is our second best shooter. Yeah. You know, as far as far as uh, scoring, especially. So now, like we're down and we're looking down the bench. Coach is looking down the bench, like, okay, <laughs> who else do I put in? And Everybody stepped up their game. It's like that magical moment that you hear people talk about when they win championships. And you can't explain it until you're actually in that moment. Right, right, right. Now, I mean, you, you've achieved the championship. I mean, you've achieved numerous awards, Rookie of the Year, MVP, Finals MVP, 
defensive player of the year, list is endless. I mean, you've been in the all decade team. Uh, so, is there anything else that you would like to achieve before you retire? I just want to be the best that I can be before I'm done. Right. You know, um, this off season I really worked on my shooting because I think when you look at, at just my career as a shooter, you know, it's kind of gone up and down. But I would really like to end my last two years just become, you know, being a better shooter. And when I walk away from the game, like I want to be the best that Tamika can be, not comparing myself to anybody else. But I know that I worked as hard as I could for 16 seasons and I gave everything that I could. And now everything transferred to me going to the front office and being a general <laughs> manager and trying to find some more players. I was going to ask you that. I mean, you announced your retirement in 2016. So what plans after that? I mean, do we see more India visits? Or? Maybe. You never know where I'll be. Um, that's what Carlos wants. <laughs> they want me to get more involved. And you never know. Um, I definitely want to be in the front office. And I want to, for an NBA or WNBA team, I want to be a general manager or president. So kind of learning that role and being put in that uh, situation and then travel the world, do camps and clinics, get married, have kids, you know, all yeah, the fun yeah. stuff that regular yeah. people do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, talk a little bit about international competition. I mean, you've, you've won three Olympic gold medals in the past and you've also represented your country in three world championships as well. So, I mean, most players you see, I mean, probably two or three international tournaments and then they're done. I mean, you keep coming back and playing for your country. So what motivates you to do that? Um, the USA, you know, when we have training camp and right when we get there, we check in, we do paperwork and, you know, do all that. And then they give you a bag with all your stuff in it. And you go up to your room with this bag, you know, like for me, when I, I open it and I lay everything out, like my jersey, my shirt, my short, my shoes, you know, my spandex, my sports, I like I lay everything out and I take a picture of it every single time because being able to represent your country is one of the highest honors that a player can ever have. We don't just, rep I don't represent just myself and my family and my team that I play with in the WNBA or my college or, like we represent every single American that comes behind us, that stands behind us. So not just the players and the athletes that you see at the Olympics. Like we as a whole represent the whole United States of America. And I think just that, like even thinking about it, it gives me chills because like just that is something that you will never forget. And so you want to relive that moment. And every year, like every opportunity that you have to represent your country, it's a new group around you, you know, players come and go. And so every single time, like people are like, oh, well, which Olympics is your favorite? You can't really say which one's your favorite because I was really young when I started. I was one of the youngest players. In 2002, yeah. Then I was the middle player. Yeah. Now I'm the oldest player, <laughs> you know. And so each time it's just like you're in a different phase of your life and different t players around you and the players, you know, your team now, like the players look up to you. And it's like you go from being the baby to the oldest and teaching them how to represent your country and how you carry yourself and the way you wear your clothes and the way you talk and just the respect that you give the others. Like that's what you teach the younger players and the younger generation. Right, right, right. That's great. I just wanted to fit in a couple of other questions. Uh, what's your pre-game music playlist? And what does it consist of? My pre-game what? <laughs> music playlist. Music. <laughs> well, I... Uh, I try not to be superstitious, but mm -hmm. I guess this is kind of going to sound superstitious, but I listen to something different okay. before every game. Okay. But uh, I love Christian music, so I'm very big in gospel and, you know, Christian artists. Right, right, right. And final question, uh, what advice or tips would you give to young Indian bowlers out there? I mean, yeah, to all, I think to all my young Indian bowlers, you know, just keep, keep working hard. You know, I think it's really important that they believe in themselves and no matter what anybody tells you you know like you can do it if you aspire to be in the nba or the wnba you can do it but you have to practice you have to work really really hard but if you have the passion you have the dedication and you're committed to what you want to do like you can do it hey tamika cashkins of the wnba indiana fever and i want to make sure that you log on check out ecolabios